Hello everyone and welcome to the 2020 virtual Africa Science Buskers Festival. My name is Sandalim Tetwa and I will be your host for today's opening ceremony. Before we start, I'd like to give a shout out to our audience in Zambia and Malawi who are screening this broadcast to many students around their communities. I say to you, Mulibwanji, and I hope you enjoy today's program. So the Science Buskers Festival is meant to celebrate the achievements of young scientists all over the world, allowing them to develop creativity in science and to facilitate the exchange of ideas amongst themselves. So this year we are celebrating 175 finalists from a total of 17 countries, from Brazil, Chile, Indonesia, all the way to South Africa, Zambia and Zimbabwe with many countries in between. What the finalists have come up with in the areas of science communication and innovation is truly remarkable and the top performing entries will be given awards on Sunday. But before we get to Sunday, let us have a look at who these 175 finalists are in this video. Wow, we are so excited to have so many scientists that are representing many countries all over the world. This is the fourth year running of the Science Buskers Festival, 
And because we are conducting it virtually this year, we have managed to reach so many young scientists beyond Zimbabwe and beyond just Africa. So I must say, this is the best festival we've had so far. The Science Buskers Festival is organized by the Zimbabwe Science Fair, whose director is Misty Knowledge Chikundi. He's also the founder of the Africa Science Buskers Festival. So in the next video, we'll hear from Mr. Chikundi, who's going to be giving us some open remarks. Welcome you all for, to this event. Hello everyone. I am so excited to welcome you to the 2020 Virtual Africa Science Buskers Festival. This is our annual STEM celebration event that focuses on science communication by young scientists and engineers in primary and high schools. This year, we are celebrating 175 young scientists and engineers from 17 countries. And I would like to congratulate all the finalists of this year's edition of the festival. Four years ago, the Science Seekers Africa program was launched in Zimbabwe. The program equipped us with new skill sets in science show performances. Our science shows make use of low cost everyday materials to demonstrate science in fun and exciting ways. It was through these science shows that we started getting messages from children expressing that they wanted to communicate science in fun and exciting ways too. And it was this feedback that gave birth to the Africa Science Buskers Festival as a platform for children to communicate science. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to make this year's edition of the festival virtual. I am so grateful to my team for all the hard work they have put in to make this event possible. This involved creating dozens of WhatsApp groups and mobilizing thousands of children, teachers and parents to join the groups. As we speak, Thousands of children are participating in this festival through WhatsApp where our teams are posting live updates from this broadcast. Apart from celebrating the finalists, we aim to ignite curiosity and a deep love for science and technology through talks, interviews, and virtual workshops. That is why we have a lineup of great and inspiring speakers throughout this festival. We acknowledge with gratitude the support of the Broadcom Foundation. I will close on this note as I show you a video of one young boy who is determined to change things in his community through science and technology and how the Broadcom Foundation is creating support systems to nature such young people. I wish you a wonderful experience in this year's edition of the Africa Science Pascals Festival. Thank you. My name is Logician Wanda from Gundu, Masingo, Zimbabwe. In 2019, I became the first Zimbabwean to participate in the Broadcom Masters International Program. I was selected by the Zimbabwean Science Fair for my project. My project was a solar-powered grinding machine. In May 2019, I traveled to Phoenix, Arizona, USA to participate in the Broadcom Masters International. In Phoenix, I met 26 other young scientists from 23 countries who participate in Ains and STEAM activities and the experience that informed me. I made friends from other countries. I was inspired when I visited the project in the Indo Isaac exhibition wall. I love solving problems using time My return from the Broadcom Master's program last year 
I have made many new innovations. I made a wind table and it won't for judging phones. I want to continue making innovations that help people and in the future I want to be an engineer. I wish you all a wonderful festival. Thank you so much, Mr. Chikundi, for your opening remarks and for organizing this very special virtual festival. And I also would like to say we are inspired by the work of Locution from Zimbabwe, who's made a solar powered grinding machine and also a wind turbine to charge phones in his rural community. So the Science Buskers Festival would definitely not be possible without the organizers, the young scientists out there who sent in their experiments, and most importantly, our sponsors and supporting organizations. So this year, the festival has been sponsored by the Broadcom Foundation and IEEE Signal Processing Society. Some of the uh, supporting organizations that we have are the American Chemical Society, the National Biotechnology Authority of Zimbabwe, and Bindura University of Science Education in Zimbabwe as well. In the next video, we are going to hear a few welcome remarks from the president of the Broadcom Foundation, Paula Golden. Hello, everyone. I'm Paula Golden, president of the Broadcom Foundation. And we are very excited to be sponsors of the African Science Buskers Festival. It is a thrill to know that all of you students are presenting exciting science and engineer projects and having an opportunity to meet other interested kids who are interested in the same subjects you enjoy. We want to tell you a little bit about Broadcom. Our founder, Henry Samueli, was, like you, an interested scientist and engineer as a kid. And he put together a radio. He was so inspired by the radio that he decided he wanted to be an engineer. And he went on to become a famous engineer who founded our company, Broadcom. So all of us at Broadcom Foundation want you to stay with the exciting adventure that you're engaged in now by becoming a scientist and engineer. We wish you good luck in sharing your projects with other students and have a really wonderful festival. Thank you so much, Paula, for your welcome remarks. So I'm sure some of you out there are wondering, so what exactly have these young scientists brought in? What are their scientific innovations and modes of science communication? So what we'll do now is we'll take a look at some of the finalist entries, not all of them. If you'd like to see all our finalist entries, you can go on to the sciencebuskers.org um, website where you can see all of them. But for now, we are going to show a few representatives that encompass several of the countries um, in this year's festival. So in our first uh, finalist, we have Jacqueline, who's from the United States of America. So Jacqueline's project is using the structure of fish scales um, uh, in ways to develop an alternative to thin film plastics. Her project isolates the collagen fibrils and reconstitutes the collagenous matrix to form a film matrix that is, uh, has tensile strength, which is comparable to lower density polyethylene and degrades naturally. Our next finalist is Rabin from Nepal whose project is called LiFi. So LiFi is a data transmission device which works on the visible light communication, also known as the VLC concept. Through his device, we'll be able to transfer audio signals. In addition, the device can also be used for internet connectivity, which requires special components. Next up as a finalist, we have Memory Vungo from Zimbabwe. Her project is on Lacasse powered rechargeable batteries. Her research has designed an efficient rechargeable battery, 
which is reliant on biological catalysts for the reversible reactions that you can find in a rechargeable battery. Our next finalist is Sendel Kia, who's from Indonesia. The project is called Sona GPS. So he says, using infrared sound emitters and receivers underwater at specific distances from each other, it is very possible to find the location of a person or a boat under or in the water from moderately long distances. So this can help when in search and rescue operations, as well as reducing cases of divers who are drifting into the ocean. Next up, we have Alice Joseph from Malawi. Her project is on purifying dirty water using homemade water treatment systems. The project is aimed at providing local communities with clean water, mainly those that uh, use rivers, uh, dug wells and lakes for domestic purposes. And I'm sure we all understand that this is not the safest means to get water. Water is life and it is an essential product, mainly during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, where everyone is asked to wash hands and have clean wa water all the time. Next up we have Charity Chirara, who happens to be the youngest finalist in this year's festival. She's only nine years old and she's from Zimbabwe. So Charity's project is on science communication and she wants to explore the effects, show the, uh, the effects of density and help people have more knowledge on the concept of density. She'll do this using floating eggs. Next up, we have Divine who is from Malawi. So his project is on the city bus station queuing system. They say, our project is a computer application that can help to regulate the movement of buses and minibuses in the main bus station of a city. The application is necessary where buses and minibuses do not follow scheduled departure timetables, but only depart when they are full. I'm sure many countries will appreciate such uh, innovation. Next up, we have Kathleen, all the way from Brazil. So her project is on organic extracts, an alternative way to control insects and disease in the production of plants. She says, my project aims to develop an organic way to repel insects like aphids and certain diseases uh, in the production of cherry tomatoes and also reducing uh, the use of agrochemicals which cause less damage to our health and to the environment. Next up, we have all the way from Tanzania, Said Hosa. His project is entitled Little BTS. So this project is all about designing electronic devices, um, which are used to boost mobile network in remote areas, especially in villages to solve the problem associated with weak signal reception. Next up, we have Asia, who is from Zimbabwe. Her project is entitled uh, Dusa Dioxide. Asia hopes to save the beautiful world from wildfire wildfires. She says, did you know, one million hectares of wildfires destroy land annually in Southern Africa alone. And also by this, she wants to save the atmosphere by recycling carbon dioxide, which would be used as a raw material in her Dusa dioxide model. So many inspirational experiments that we have, ranging from computer science, biology, chemistry, and everything else in between. So we are indeed proud of everything that our young finalists have, and I wish them all the best um, in Sunday ceremony for the awards. So now we are going to have our keynote speech. But before that, um, we are going to show you a video um, that was sent in by some of our finalists to show the cool things about the countries where they are from. Enjoy this next video. a very proud South African citizen. South Africa has a rich history, beautiful scenery, and it's home to wonderful and caring people. It doesn't end there. 
It also has interesting facts, but I was intrigued by one of them. The Table Mountain in South Africa is one of the oldest mountains in the world. This mountain attracts so many tourists and it towers over the city like a watchful gentle giant. Isn't South Africa a nice country? Yes, I know. Thank you. Joseph Kaila from South Africa and South Africa is one of the biggest, biggest, biggest countries in Africa to produce a large amount of meat. I keep a photograph in which we were in love caught in your eyes waiting for the sunrise. My name is Said Boja. I'm coming from Tanzania. It's born from East of Africa. In Tanzania, we have a different culture, and the only famous tribe in Tanzania is Maasai tribe. And uh, the picture here, this is a Maasai girl and a Maasai boy. In Tanzania, we have a different tourism. Tourist attraction such as Mount Kilimanjaro, Serengeti, etc. You are warmly welcome in my country. For Africa, Neto Oliver, good living. Tanzania is a country located at the east coast of Africa. Tanzania has some great interesting facts such as that the first human skull discovered in Old Dubai Gorge are written by Dr. Louis Leakey. The second fact is that Tanzania has the highest mountain in Africa called Mount Kilimanjaro and it's also the third highest mountain in the world. The third fact is that one of the biggest and the tastiest crops is found in the east coast of Tanzania. Also, Tanzania speaks the Swedish language called Swahili and this <laughs> And I'm Jordan. We are from Mountain House, California, in, in the United, United States, States of America. America. So, so excited, excited to virtually meet you all. Hello, my name is Ibrahim and I'm from America. The interesting fact about America is it's the land of opportunity with inventors and entrepreneurs being celebrated here. In fact, the United States is at the center of global innovation, with airplanes, cell phones, the internet, and computers all made here in the USA. Hello everyone, this is a science team from Menga Combined School in Zambia. Zambia is a beautiful country with a lot of characteristics. We have minions. We have safaris. We are a peaceful nation. We are happy to have participated in the 2020 Basket Science Festival, thanks to our organizers and the Australia Embassy to Zambia. Yay! from Zimbabwe, here is something interesting about my country. Zimbabwe, a name derived from the stone structures of an ancient ruin, Mazimbabwe, currently known as Great Zimbabwe, meaning houses of stones, now a world heritage site. Mazimbabwe, a construction of stones without any mortar, showing the civilization and creativity of my ancestors. I love my country. <laughs> Wow, so many beautiful countries all over the world. We've seen so much meat in South Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, the safaris in Zambia, cool places in California, and the Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe.
Now, I definitely want to go to some of these places. Okay, so now I will introduce our keynote speaker for the day, who's Professor Sina, the Deputy Vice Chancellor in Research and Internationalization at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. He will be speaking on the fourth industrial revolution. So feel free to send any comments or questions using the comment section on Facebook or YouTube for our speaker during his address. Over to you, Professor. Uh, region. So thanks very much um, for, for that display. I want to start by acknowledging um, the, you know, the sponsors as well as in particularly to knowledge uh, who got me involved uh, with this particular event and for this, uh, this talk. Uh, I'm going to turn over to some of my, to my slide deck, which uh, I've prepared and the talk that uh, I have uh, thought about during this time is a talk uh, which deals with uh, resilience and the fourth industrial revolution. Now, I know that uh, many of you are, uh, you know, we are at an interesting period during this time of COVID-19. And it is a time where, you know, some of our hope gets uh, somewhat uh, diminished. But at the same time, like we are using this virtual platform today, we find that we are able to find one another, uh, connect with one another, and that is by leveraging the power of technology. So there are certain innovations that emerge during this period, and that uh, helps us to renew hope. Um, and that's uh, an important uh, thematic uh, direction that I will try to pick up during this presentation. I do connect quite a bit uh, with the area of uh, the science expos. Uh, I have once uh, upon a time myself in the 90s participated in a science expo with, or a set of science expos, which uh, is called the Northern Gauteng uh, Science Expo. And I connected uh, particularly to the science expo arena. Um, and uh, that was one of the avenues that helped me enter into the world of engineering. Uh, I uh, practiced, uh, you know, electronic engineering was my uh, chosen path, uh, and it is my current area. Uh, of course, I've today specialized in microelectronics, and that's really where I contribute. But uh, the area was really, Science Expo played a major role, and I want to talk a bit more from that perspective um, here too. Um, and I, I'll tell you what is very inspiring about science expos um, and about science fairs. Uh, it's an old quotation which comes from Ben Franklin. And I'll read it. Uh, I know you're reading it, but I'll read it uh, because it says something important, which is tell me and I forget, teach me and I learn and I remember, involve me and I learn. And I think that the avenue or the platform that you have when it comes to a science expo or a science fair does bring me, it does bring the point of involve me and I learn. In fact, Benjamin Franklin introduced the first uh, library in 1731, which was in Philadelphia. And uh, I noticed that Sandile, when you were introducing us, you also acknowledged the IEEE Signal Processing Society. IEEE, interestingly enough, uh, also has some roots uh, in Philadelphia, where one of the first library uh, libraries came about. And that library was not merely a library of books. It also had a makerspace. It also had a space where those that visit the library had the chance to make. Uh, and by making and by using their hands, they had the opportunity to learn and engage uh, differently. I want to particularly acknowledge uh, Broadcom here as well, in the sense that, um, as I was speaking with knowledge about an hour ago, uh, it occurred to me that uh, you know the those of you that are participating in this uh, this event, some of you are in areas where you have a good internet connectivity, but some of you are in areas 
where you actually may not be may not be seeing uh, these slides. You are only listening to an audio stream through a WhatsApp channel. That I think is really it's really uh, interesting on how the technologies have come together to reach several hundreds or, or even thousands of people. Uh, and that uh, again brings us an in, that again brings a component of how technology can leverage in connecting us in different parts of the of the world where we are. Now I've had uh, some experience in areas uh, such as in Indola in Zambia, in uh, Macha in Zambia, uh, in areas of Zimbabwe, and uh, you know the, a number of the solutions that have come up. And I'm going to touch on some of the solutions as we progress uh, in this talk. I'm going to step in and out of uh, the COVID-19 period and the period which is the pre-COVID-19 uh, period and also to help construct what might constitute a post-COVID-19 uh, period. We don't know what that might really be because we don't know when the vaccine will come about and that vaccine would uh, really take us into a post-COVID-19 period, truly speaking. But until then, we have to be able to learn how to coexist with COVID-19, um, and that means that uh, you know some of the health protocols that have been established in your areas remain key. But for many of us, as we have engaged with the COVID-19 period, this diagram might give you a feel for what has happened. We have our immediate reaction has been of caution, it has been of managing the risk, and it has been to ensure that the health of our of people are are maintained and are enabled but there is something uh, which i think uh, really lends to what we as human beings are is our ability to adapt and when i think about resilience it is really reflective of that ability for us to adapt but there is something a bit more and broader to that which is the aspect of sustainability and some some folks uh, you know swap what resilience and sustainability would mean there is an inter there is perhaps an interconnectedness in the way that we think about it now the key thing is that one not only uh, and humanity has not only adapted but has actually often come out stronger post a pandemic uh, and pandemics could be comparable to wars like the world war 2 it's just a different form. But when humanity has emerged from that, humanity has become stronger. And that, I think, is an important area and it's something to take away, is that when, when we come out of this period, and if we are hopeful and if we are innovative, those innovations are likely to remain and those innovations will make us stronger than what we have today. Now, I want to uh, pause a bit on what constitutes the industrial revolutions. Sandile talked about the fourth industrial revolution. So what does it mean in perspective of the earlier three forms of, of industrial revolutions? There were the, the first industrial revolution led to mechanization and it was driven by a form of energy called steam. So if you think about steam engines, that's the area. Second industrial revolution came about key energy there or key impetus there was electricity. Interestingly, IEEE was referenced uh, earlier on as one of the sponsors, and IEEE actually uh, came about due to the advent of electricity. In fact, it actually came about like we have today at, as, a, as a fair where people were being invited to come and witness a new invention around about 1884, which was electricity. And as uh, the, uh, the engagement or the conference was set up, it needed to generate uh, some some money and some sponsors, and the sponsors came together, and they contributed, and that led uh, to the creation of IEEE at the time as AIEEE, or the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Of course, we saw that evolving together with another organization called the Institute for Radio Engineers, which then uh, merged, the two organizations merged to form IEEE in 1963. Now, that second point, that second point of merger of the Institute of Radio Engineers uh, happened, uh, you know, the process started around about 1947. So what was the key thing that happened in 1947 was the invention of a new technology called transistors. 
transistors uh, uh, changed the way that computing occurs. Um, and over time, it developed where computing and communication converged. And this convergence then led to a big invention, another big invention called the internet. The internet then drew people together from all over the world. And that uh, platform led to new businesses, new models. It finds us today connected. But in this platform of the internet, something else happened. And that was a lot of data. A lot of data started to move in and out of that internet and started to connect between the physical world and the cyber world. At the same time, something else was happening, was that computing was becoming more and more powerful. And, we, and, and, in, and an old invention called artificial intelligence gained, a super, gained quite a bit of, of power as it developed into um, a confluence of technologies. And this confluence of technologies led to what we call today the fourth industrial revolution. So what is the fourth industrial revolution? It is the culmination of different type of technologies. Uh, but more uh, especially, what makes the fourth industrial revolution interesting is that it brings people, it brings humanity and technology in close symbiosis, where the one is able to leverage the strength of the other. And that, I think, is important. It is not one replacing the other. It is actually about that symbiotic relationship between humanity and technology. So that is another very important takeaway. So if you have to now think about the way that economy grows, and one, and traditionally, when you are driving in an area or you are in an area where there is development, some of you are in areas close to a mining environment. You might be in the area of Undola, which took benefit of the copper of copper. And as copper came about, you started to see development. You started to see infrastructure developing. When you see infrastructure developing, that is one sign that shows that there is economic growth. Now, another form of economic growth, like we have in some of the areas where we have the oceans, is called the oceans economy, where you harvest from the oceans, whether it is from uh, you know, fish, but also other forms, like salt is another area. And so you don't see that as, as clearly. Uh, you see that in an invisible form. Uh, in, in or to a lesser extent, you might, if you're in the area where you're close to an ocean, you may see something. And so that's another area where you see economic growth. But there is another force, which is almost invisible, which is called the digital economy. And in the digital economy, that is still the third industrial revolution. It is the internet, where there's a lot of data. And like the ocean, and there's a saying about the ocean, because the water in the ocean is salty, there is a saying that says that the, there is so much water, but not a single drop to drink. Now, of course, you can desalinate and you can drink, and that's, that's processed. Uh, but in the digital economy, you have a similar type of thing happening. You have lots of data, and we're able to use some of that data, but not all of it. Now, in the third industrial revolution, in the inter using the internet, you start to use some of the data, you start to bring a convergence to the data, and you're able to use perhaps about 25% of the data. Now, the opportunity in the fourth industrial revolution is actually to use much more of that data, uh, and that is where the data exploration starts to create new jobs, and it starts to shape what constitutes the future world of work. And the question is, how do you, through deliberate innovations, harness the potential of the cyber world? So this is a new world. It's a new world that augments the physical world, and it creates new opportunities. If you are thinking about one, one uh, thing to just to help you take this point home, is that you might be using an Apple device. One, the founder of Apple was Steve Jobs, together with uh, Steve Wozniak. 
And we often think about Steve Jobs in the context of Apple, in the context of technology. But, but do also, and this is a, a bit of a joke, but if you think about his surname, Jobs, Apple created a lot of jobs because it was able to harness the power of the cyber world. And that is an important part of where the future is going to be. Do, you, do we build physical roads to connect one another? Yes, we do. But in some cases, we're able to expedite those connections like we are today. I know that I'm connecting with some of you who are in Malawi. We wouldn't have been able to do that unless we had the leverage of technology, unless we had the leverage of that cyber world. That's another important area. Now, these worlds start to come together. So here you see a picture of a drone which goes into the water. And this drone harvests information from the ocean, which, by the way, humanity is not able to reach those depths of the ocean unless it leverages technology. And by doing that, it is able to understand how the ocean's economy can be used, but in a sustainable way. And so you can see the confluence of technologies that enters not only the physical world, but also the oceans. Uh, and this coming, this coming together, the technology, the physical world, and the oceans, this, is, uh, this uh, component is called the, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Another aspect is how do you understand biology? If you think about ants, ants uh, have led to a creation of what we call ant algorithm because they're able to uh, you know, utilize uh, you know, their formation, their colony formations in being able to work as a team. Now, some of you who are participating today, you use the word team, but you know, sometimes we think of a team as together, everyone achieves more. Um, and that's what ants have shown us. And if you think about other animals, if you think about the gemspock, the gemspock is an animal which uh, is uh, in, in Namibia and in South Africa and in the desert areas of Botswana. But what is very interesting about the gemspock is that it has an ability to cool. And that cooling, that cooling is something that computers use if you want to gain high speed. And that's why you will find that if you're using a computer, it has a fan. And that is showing us how people, how animals work, and how that translates into technology. So all of this is interconnected. Now, it is not that. This is a chart from a book uh, which is called Thank You for Being Late. It's a nice book if you want to get a copy of it. But what this book shows is that it is not that human adaptability did not exist. Humans were adapting, but technology was growing at a much faster pace. Now, around about this point of 2007, one started to find Apple, one started to find uh, iPhones, one started to find Facebook, and one started to find many of these different new type of technologies. Of course, Apple has come about uh, much longer, uh, much long before that, but in 2007, the iPhone came about. And it was a different way of thinking about it, but it was very simple. And if you think about the logo of the Apple phone, it is an apple. And some of you might wonder, why is there a bite? If you look at the Apple symbol of, of, the, of the logo, there's a bite. And the reason for that bite is because some believe that it is because it needed to be different, needed to be different from a tomato, because an apple and a tomato in picture might look similar. And so you can see immediately that the way that Apple has been thinking is to think about the same old problem, but differently. And in that, in so doing, to find new solutions. Now, at the University of Johannesburg, we have adopted the fourth industrial revolution as the context of our strategy, because we know that human adaptability will continue to happen. But if we are able to leverage the power of technology, we are able to find that adaptability, in fact, expediting. Now, COVID-19 has come about. It's a really, it's a nasty experience. It has displaced the context in which we have always operated. And ordinarily, we would in fact find adaptability being brought by technology.
But what COVID-19 has brought about is it has accelerated the utilization of technology in order to deal with the health crisis and in to some extent to deal with the financial crisis. Now that is important particularly for us in on the continent because there is great digital divide. But even in that divide there are solutions. For example, you might be in area in an area where there is weak internet connection. And in some parts like in Nairobi what Google has done is that Google has flown a balloon and on that balloon is a is the necessary antennas and and so and what they call a base station which is flown into that area to help bring digital connectedness so suddenly you start to realize that when you think about the same old problem new and different and if you are open minded you are able to find that there are solutions especially when it comes to being inclusive and when it comes to connecting people who are otherwise not connected so that we can build a world which is a lot more equal now one way to think about all of this is to think in terms of the sustainable development goals i'm not going to get time to go into the details of this but what this is saying is don't think about technology in isolation but think about technology in the context of benefiting society in fact if you look at the tagline of IEEE the tagline of IEEE is advancing technology for humanity and that is a context enabler that one must think about now i know that sometimes you are here and you feel a little despondent but have a look at this sentence and sometimes if you read this you might be reading this as opportunity is nowhere however if you look at the same text a little differently you look at the same text differently you start to see that if you shift the gaps you find opportunity is now here so it is a choice of how we shift the gaps and these gaps will bring about new solutions now south africa this is a picture from cape town and it's just to show and illustrate how deeply we have inequality uh, in our different parts of the continent and this is an example in cape town where you see huge differences 10 minutes apart and so we have to try and constantly keep in mind how do we bring solutions that will close the digital inequality gap now i want to talk about this it's important that uh, especially that i have recognized that you know this virtual science expo is often a, is about stem but i want to disturb that pattern a bit and i want to add the a for a for arts because many times when we're thinking about solutions we're forgetting that the magic happens when we think at the cross of multiple disciplines if you think about a game if you think about a game like uh, angry birds angry birds was developed by people that did coding but it primarily developed because an artist was looking at a very frustrated was looking at a frustrated programmer and said ha huh, let me actually draw his anger this person's angry face and that started to create a new dimension so that is important and if you are coming into so there are different ways in how you can access technology the fourth industrial revolution and the arts is one of them now there are a number of of platforms like grasshopper which is a free coding uh, platform you don't have to have a computer you can actually use your mobile phone to learn coding and it will take you into very quickly of how to do coding uh, and there is no cost apart from the cost of the data that you may have to pay now i'm putting this here because i know that at times hope is lost and you know things that come in front of you looks like a set of mountains it looks like a set of challenges but sometimes we don't know what is beyond that mountain and it might just be a view like this and the reason why i say this is because if you're engaging science from a science expo point of view you might be finding yourself at failure and for me there is nothing like failure but failure is just success deferred and you you will be successful uh, and and that is important as well because on sunday i know that you will have awards being uh, given but if you don't get an award award don't see that as negative it is just a recognition 
that there is a bit more work to be done uh, and those awards will be coming it's just a matter of time so think about impossible as i am possible i'm going to talk a little bit about simplicity as the ultimate sophistication give you a couple of examples now i actually uh, when i started uh, you know my background was in electronic engineering but i'll tell you that when i was in high school some of the things that inspired me to look at uh, engineering was not very complex uh, computers and things like that but was actually very simple things one of those simple things uh, was uh, the aspect of a lemon of how a lemon actually becomes a is used as a battery now today in south africa one of the problems we have with our mining is the ability of uh, of what is something called an acid mine drain uh, and and that uh, it's a complex problem but basically it's a it's a problem of pollution and it's so interesting because you have grass and grass is like this uh, two needles and between the grass you start to see some transmission taking place so that shows you that simplicity is an is an is a form of uh, sophistication it's a form of conductivity another example is here you might be seeing algae and i asked some of our students at one point is how do you actually clear the algae and a lot of the students in engineering came up with solutions such as well you know are we not going to use uh, you know different different type of sensors to detect algae and from there to uh, you know have uh, technology clean it up however there was one student who was probably not very good and this student was actually coming from the kitwe area and this student said to me that why do we need technology why don't we put fish because certain type of fish will take the algae away and for him fish didn't require any kind of electrical energy which meant it was self sustainable so sometimes thinking outside the box gives us solutions which are sustainable that's an important takeaway to take from here some more examples of simplicity today you see this type of a base station which uh, does uh, cell phone communication by the way where did it start it started once upon a time where a dentist uh, had a kite and at a distance this dentist planted another kite and found that these kites actually have connectivity if you bring about a disturbance in the one area that was in 1872 today this phenomenon looks like this so you can see that the way that we come into technology is very different i don't have time to go into this but uh, you will have access to the slides uh, this is some ventilator designs in the area in the time of covid-19 as a way of having a health response utilizing technology and i want to talk about some resources because some of you might be in areas where you may not have funding to be able to fund your aspirations and one funding avenue that is available is called the engineering projects in community service and that is when you're using technology to serve people and then there is some funding available and i'll leave this slide deck uh, with the organizers so that you can access this later on this is one example of a project which was com completed in kampala in uganda and this particular project was to equip uh, this uh, this uh, lady to work with uh, solar powers and by using solar powers she started to charge uh, for cell phones by the way initially it was for her phone and then around this charging process she developed a business to help charge other people's phones and when she helped with them they could learn and use uh, apps such as grasshopper that one i showed you earlier and so you can see that simple technologies at times can be your big enablers sometimes we don't see that power of a technology another useful site uh, because many of you are still in high school and you may be thinking about engineering programs is a website called tryengineering.org which was funded by IBM and this website uh, gives you access into uh, engineering now in my closing remarks what i want to you to take away is that when you're thinking about technology and you're thinking about science ultimately it is to the benefit of humanity that's the first part if we start to think about deeply about how do you use technology to be inclusive and if your team has diversity you start to find yourself enabling two things one is excellence and two is innovation and so i always think of it as diversity 
inclusivity and leading to equality, leading to excellence, interconnected. But one other comment I want to make about technology, because I have presented it as very positive, is there is another side of technology. Now, some of you might be using a mobile phone to give you and find directions. You might be using Google Maps. You might be using Waze. You might be using other tools. And if you haven't been using these tools yet, in future, you might be finding yourself using tools where your cell phone helps to give you direction. That's very nice. It's an important thing that one achieves. On the other hand, you might be finding in future that you are driving and you're using such a tool to give you directions. Meanwhile, your fuel company that sells you petrol or diesel, that company might develop an algorithm that says, how can I optimize my income? Now, that algorithm works not in an intended way, but in an unintended way with the mapping software that is giving you directions as you are driving. And then you find that these algorithms in the back end, they collude. And when they collude, they take you on a slightly longer distance because that longer distance will give the fuel company, it will give the diesel company additional revenue. Now, that is the other side of technology where if you're not careful you can have unintended consequences so it is important that when you think about technology be, be also cognizant that you can find a arena where you have colonization by algorithms it is therefore important to think about the context once again the societal context in which technology is used and when we are thinking about it from a transformative impact we're likely to find solutions and contend with solutions that uh, uh, you know that are to not contend but to develop solutions which enable ethical alignment and so with those words i'm going to to end off it is just after 4 p.m and uh, that was the time I was allocated. And we can certainly uh, have some discussion uh, as, as if, the, if time allows for that. Thank you, Sandile. One question. I think I was muted there for a second. There's one question for you, um, which is now on the screen. I think it's saying, does this quarantine time have improved the usage of technology or has it actually been a struggle, especially for developing countries? Yeah, I want to take you back. I want to take you back because pandemics have, this is not the first time we are in a pandemic. And I did show you earlier on in my text that opportunity is nowhere can be read as opportunity is now here. One person that saw that during one of the earlier pandemics was Newton. During that time, Newton discovered the law of gravity. And I, I guess if Newton at the time had other avenues, perhaps we wouldn't have that law of gravity. So I want you to think about it like this, that Yes, it has, in a way, created a digital disconnect. On the other hand, we have found, because South Africa, South Africa is the second most unequal country in the world. And what we have experienced is that it has forced us to think a lot more inclusive than before. So when we are using technology, we are often using it together with WhatsApp because it enables us to use data better and to use and be able to communicate even in areas where there may not be a strong component of connectivity. So I would say that, yes, you are right that it has. And if we are not careful about this, if we don't think about inclusivity, what is going to happen post the pandemic is that those that have will have more and those who have less will have even less. And so, we, during this period, have to ensure solutions that will enable equity and equality 
ultimately for social justice. And so that would be the way that I would think about it and not be disheartened because the solutions to some of the challenges are often in your own area, just like that fish, fish eating algae. By the way, algae produces hydrogen. Hydrogen pro produces an energy that leads to a hydrogen cell. How many of us have thought about algae producing hydrogen? It was one of the inventions. So sometimes the energy is quite close to us. Right. Thank you so much for your insight, Professor. Right. I hope you young scientists out there have listened and got to know more about the fourth industrial revolution, what it is and how you can leverage on these extraordinary technological advances, especially for the future. I would really encourage you to read more on this. Also, thank you very much, Professor, for highlighting some of the avenues of funding and opportunities that some of these budding engineers can take advantage of. And remember, opportunity is now here. Right, so moving on, we are going to have an interview session next up uh, with two very inspiring scientists who are both currently studying towards an undergraduate degree in the United States. But before we head over to the interview, we have another shout out video. So we're going to play a shout out video to see some more cool places of where our finalists are from. Hello, today we will be teaching you the theory a drink from South and Midwest Brazil. For the drink, you can drink with juice of lemon or water. And in the cup, I put one third, or one third of herba mate and put the juice inside with the pump and drink. country with beautiful and unique landscapes on north and south. Chile is full of supportive people, strong and capable of overcoming anything hardship with tradition and a great culture. And most importantly, Chileans always give their hearts to their work. Finally, I'm really happy and proud to represent my country and my school. Thank you. <laughs> from Rumahir, Indonesia and Find that Recognition. See you on final 2020 Virtual Africa Science Basket Festival. Bye bye. Banda from Malawi, the home heart of Africa, the, a country which is well known by its lake, which is the fourth largest water, fresh water body in, in the world, and also it is well known by its cultural diversity. I'm encouraging all young, all young scientists to believe themselves in such as African continent. We can also be well known with salsa. Senior Minister, the Legal Visa Having Service Team, Achievement and Name.
Naming Intangible Cultural Heritage of Humanity, translating with dishes such as mole, chile de nogada, tamales, and pozole. We are the only culture where dying is not an impediment to continue enjoying the pleasure of eating. It is believed that every year on Dia de Muertos, souls return to meet their loved ones and together enjoy the delicious pan de muertos. Chang from Nigeria. I'm representing New Hall International School, Lagos, Nigeria. Nigeria is a multi ethnic country of about 200 million people. Nigeria is the sixth largest oil producer in the world. Nigeria film industry, Nollywood, is the second largest in terms of movies produced annually. Nigeria is a friendly and accommodating, and we love to travel. Thank you for your time. Wow, so many more beautiful places I want to visit. Did you guys see the tasty drinks from Brazil, the dancing from Brazil, so much culture in the mountains in Chile, Lake Malawi, beautiful Turkey, and yummy food from Mexico. I think after this pandemic, I'm definitely going to take a trip to one of these countries. Now onwards to our interview, which is entitled, Be the Change You Want to See. So we have two inspirational scientists. And the first one is Danielle Githers, who is the first black female MIT student body president. She holds four scholarships as an MIT student and also has several awards, one of them being the Women and Girls in Soka Award, which is given to only four women in the whole of America. Secondly, we have Pelagia Majoni, who is Zimbabwean, she is the first Zimbabwean to have an asteroid named after her by MIT. I mean, how cool is that? She also holds several awards and medals, and one of them is the 2020 Student of Vision Abbey Award. Once again, please send in your questions for our Q&A uh, section at the end of the interview using the comment section on Facebook or YouTube. So firstly, on to our interview. Can you guys tell us more about yourselves? Who are you and what do you do? I'll start with Danielle. Hey, um, so you gave a pretty good introduction. My name is Danielle Gathers. I'm a rising junior at MIT um, and I'm studying mechanical engineering. Um, so as student body president, I basically work as a voice for students, kind of communicating with administrators. Um, it's super very important now because of COVID-19 and general race relations in America. Um, so I'm very excited to be in this position. Thank you so much. Pelagia. I'm sorry, Pelagia, you might have to turn up your mic. I don't think we can hear you. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, thank you. So can you go again, please? Okay. Hi, I'm Pelagia Majoni. I'm from Zimbabwe, and um, I'm a computer science major here in the U.S. I'm on a full scholarship at Harvard College. Um, last uh, summer, I was doing a software engineering internship with Warner Media. But when I'm not working, I love using my skills in tech to empower African women. So um, I taught an introduction to programming class in Zimbabwe last winter break. Thank you so much, guys, for introducing yourselves. So my first question will go to Danielle. So you are student body president and you're also a mechanical engineer. 
Could you tell us how your role as student body president adds on to you as an engineer in fostering change in your community? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, one really important part of engineering that we kind of um, don't really think about a lot is leadership. Um, I think when you're leading a team specifically, there's a lot of like project management roles. So I think something that really helped me um, in terms of student body president and kind of transferring over to my um, learning how to be an engineer is that like managing projects, being able to set up a correct timeline and kind of understanding all the factors. I think something else is like how important creativity is in engineering and problem solving skills. And I think also being student body president, those are also skills I need to leverage and develop. Thank you so much, Danielle. I think uh, this is very encouraging because a lot of the times as scientists, we are always doing experiments, but uh, we need to take up other roles so that we can actually foster real change in our communities. That's, that's very true. And leadership is a good component of you being a student body president. Um, so I'll ask my next question to um, Pelagia. So Pelagia, I read that you had a project on electricity generation from potatoes. Could you tell us a bit more about that? What inspired it and what did you achieve with this project? Thanks for the question, Danielle. So um, I grew up in the outskirts of Zimbabwe. And uh, when I was in high school, I had the struggle of not having electricity. So I could not study at night and how well I did in school. So I felt the need to be the one to actually come up with something to solve this problem that I and a lot of other people in my community were struggling with. So um, I was talking to Mrs. Kunti about it. Um, and uh, I started working on the project, um, got a lot of support. Um, it took me about uh, eight months to get done with the project because there was a lot of ups and downs um, and a lot of shortages of resources. Um, sorry. So um, I ended up uh, just going in with the project and I was very passionate about it because I knew that it was going to solve a problem that affected me. So I ended up creating a battery uh, from decayed potato paste um, and adding a lot of chemicals just to try to boost um, the currents that was, be that was being generated from the battery. And um, I presented that battery at um, South Africa Science Fair, the regional science fair. And then I ended up going to the US and presenting my project there. Wow, that is so inspiring. You know, when I see potatoes, the only thing I think about is how can I eat them? But some great people out there are thinking we can actually generate electricity from this. So can I ask, is this, is this a project still ongoing? So um, when I came to the US, uh, I wanted to continue with the project. So I worked in the chemistry lab uh, for a year, working, continuing my work on this project. Uh, but as I was working on it, uh, I realized some flaws and I started uh, to try and see other ways to solve the same problem. So I'm still working on other ways, but not specifically on this same project. Right, okay. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, Danielle, so as student body president, being at MIT, are there moments where you might have doubted yourself as an engineer uh, or when campaigning to be president? And there were, if there were moments like that, how do you think you overcame it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we have something at MIT called imposter syndrome, and I think that happens a lot to everyone. Um, I think at MIT, a lot of people are used to being the top of their class, and then when you come to MIT, it can be very jarring um, to be kind of one of the um, closed people in your class sometimes. Um, so I've definitely had that experience, specifically studying mechanical engineering, which is a really popular major at the school. Um, in terms of running for president, um, I definitely doubted myself at first. I didn't know if it was one a responsibility I wanted to take on, and then two, if it would be, um, if people would vote for me, if I could even win. Um, so how I got around that was really just speaking to my friends. I think it's very easy to get kind of caught up in your own world and like of self doubt and insecurities versus I think if you're able to get other perspectives, specifically other people's perspectives on you and your abilities, it can be really helpful and inspiring and kind of can push you over the edge. 
Right. Thank you so much for your answer. And I would like to say as well, in addition, that there are moments where you can definitely doubt yourself as a scientist, but but just keep going, overcome it, get into circles with people who are inspirational to you and can who and who can motivate you to to do better. Um, Pelagia, so currently you're studying towards a degree in computer science, if I'm correct, right? Yeah. So what triggered your passion in computer science? What do you want to achieve as a computer scientist? So um, when I was at Intel Science Fair in the US in my last year of high school, I moved around a lot of booths uh, trying to see what other people were working on. And I was always intrigued when I came around technology projects um, and projects to do with um, electrical engineering. So I was like, I re I'm really curious about this field. And uh, when I went into college in the US, I wanted to be a physics major. I took physics classes, but I also took computer science classes. Um, and I realized after um, a year of comparison that I was more interested in tech. It seemed to me like it was um, a way to solve the broad range of problems that I was interested in because uh, I'm very interested in agriculture. I'm also interested in electricity problems. Um, and I felt like tech was um, a good mage uh, to solve all these problems. Um, so I decided to just continue taking CS classes and um, taking online classes about CS. Um, and it really um, came all together because I realized that with tech, I'm able to apply it to a lot of different fields. Right, okay. So you hadn't done computer science before before you're taking it up as a major. So how did you overcome that battle of starting something new? One, you're in a new environment. You just come from Zimbabwe. You're now in the United States. Two, you're starting something different totally. So what word of advice would you give to other young scientists who, can, who might find themselves in that situation? Yeah, um, so yeah, you're right. Like I just come from Zimbabwe and it was definitely a new environment. So I was trying to adjust and I was also working 20 hours a week as part of my work study scholarship um, on campus. So um, I was trying to uh, handle a lot of things at the same time. Uh, and I really struggled my first year. Um, and sometimes I still do, but then having a community of uh, women in tech to reach out to, um, really helped me, like the community and having people will say they also face the same struggles, you're not alone and you have people to go in the journey with, uh, that really helped me. And um, something that also I struggled with was um, understanding the professors because they speak in a different way from Zimbabwean teachers uh, because of the, their different accent. Uh, and also being understood by the professors. So all these challenges and also being the only black woman in the class, um, like there was some stigma associated with that. And you suddenly realize, oh, I'm black when all your life you were just like everyone else. Um, so all these challenges, I was able to navigate them by finding communities who identify with me, even if that meant uh, online communities, off-campus communities and, um, Basically, uh, what I've also learned is to just uh, keep going with something. If you cannot walk, at least crawl, um, because at some point uh, you'll be able to to see uh, a, a brighter future. You just have to keep going. At some point, that, that's the least that you can do, like just keep going until it gets better. So I'm still at that point where I'm, I'm, I'm not getting the hang of it. It's a very challenging field, um, but I, I just try and keep going and try and do side projects, try and look for mentors, try and be in communities that support me. Thank you so much for saying that, Pelagia. I think the highlight of this is showing that there are times where you can either doubt yourself and there are also times where you feel like you're struggling. But what Pelagia has highlighted is if you can't run, walk, if you can't walk, crawl. If you can't crawl, stand still and look for someone who can push you, you know? So always have that community of people who can help you and everything will be okay at the end of it all. Right, so right now we're just going to take a short break um, and then we'll come back to the interview session. We're going to show you um, highlights of another shout out video um, from some of the finalists. Have a look at this. Thank you. 
Welcome to the land of Himalayas, land of peace, temples, the nation where the humanity and hospitality is the greatest religion. The place from where put the light in this entire world. The nation where cultures and festivals are celebrated every day. Kindness, love and respect flows in everyone's blood. In spite of the people with different culture, tradition and religion, here is the unity and diversity. Namaste everyone. We are representing the beautiful country. Hi everyone, I'm Zainab Ibrahim, I'm 16 years old and I'm from Tunisia. I'm an active member in ATAS, the Tunisian Association for the Future of Science and Technology. I'm fond of science, technologies, inventions and innovations. In fact, this kind of deep thinking was the very impetus for my passion for science. This curiosity and desire to explore the implications of science pushed me to completely immerse myself in it. My actual passion for science began with a little something called science fair and here I am now. I'm presenting myself as a finalist in the African competition that I would like to thank all its organizers. Thank you for your attention and goodbye. Hello from Tunisia. My name is Shema Zahama. I'm 19 years old. I'm a Tunisian girl. Tunisia is such a tropical paradise sitting on the top of Africa. Well, it's a must see. I've been a member and a Tassian for nine years now and still counting. Atas, obviously, Atas is a place where creativity and inventions meet science and technology. And I'm really hooked on scientific, scientific inventions and innovations. So here I am, honored to be a finalist in that African competition. I'm so thankful for all the organizers. Thank you and goodbye. Did you know that Zimbabwe is one of the countries of Africa and it's landlocked? My country is one of the richest countries in terms of culture, agriculture and minerals. Did you know that Zimbabwe is home to one of the seven wonders of the world? Yes, right here, the Victoria Falls. It's as wide as one kilometer and longer than 20 kilometers. That's a lot of water. I want to show you my country, what it offers in terms of culture. Thank you so much for sending those through from Nepal, Tunisia and Zimbabwe. Right, so continuing on with our interview with Danielle and Pelagia, I am happy to see so many questions you guys are sending through, send more questions and we'll have a Q&A after the interview. So to Danielle, you are starting to be a uh, mechanical engineer at the moment, but I read that your career path is in patent law. So could you tell us a bit about what ignited that dream to be a patent lawyer? What exactly is a patent lawyer? And what do you intend to do with this career? Yeah, so I think the part of engineering I like the most is actually focusing on the consumer. Um, so figuring out how products are made in a way that really um, lends to consumer needs. And I think part of intellectual property is understanding what makes an invention new, what makes it novel. Um, so that's something that's kind of always kind of um, triggered excitement for me. Um, so just in terms of going to MIT, getting a mechanical engineering degree, and then hopefully after going to law school, um, where I can hopefully help litigate. So basically, um, specifically in America, our patent law system is like a first to file patent. So if you invent something, um, you can protect it if you file um, with the patent office. Um, so it's really important specifically thinking about minority inventors and who historically has been left out in terms of patents. But as soon as you come up with a really good idea and you have like a proof of use that you file a patent just to protect that idea specifically from larger corporations. Um, so that's what I'm excited to hopefully pursue after I graduate. 
Okay, thank you for that answer. So if any one of you finds yourself in the United States and you have an invention that needs to be patented, you can definitely um, contact Danielle. Right, on to Pelagia. So Pelagia, what does the future look um, like for you as a computer scientist? What are your goals and your dreams? Um, thank you for the question, Danielle. So um, my main uh, dream is to be able to empower um, girls in Zimbabwe using technology, but I also want to empower even marginalized communities and that include men too, uh, but my immediate um, community that I want to empower are women. Um, so I feel like um, tech can be used to solve a lot of problems, um, as I mentioned before. So um, I hope to continue working on projects like solving electricity problem, food shortage problems. Um, and in order to finance that goal, I hope to get a job as a software engineer here in the US um, with one of the tech companies. So currently I've been participating in programs with Warner Media, uh, Pinterest, um, and uh, a lot of big tech companies. Um, so I hope to be able to uh, be able to finance myself to solve the problems that appeal the most to me in Zimbabwe using tech. That sounds like a very great plan. And those are very big goals. I'm sure you will achieve them. You are definitely going to be the change that you want to see in your country and your continent. All right, so to you both, I'd like to ask, imagine you lived in a perfect world, right? Where, Danielle, you're the student body president, but this time you are the president of the world. What one mandatory law would you enforce that aims to make the world a better place through science? I'll start with the Danielle. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a very serious question. Um, maybe one thing I would say was like, um, I think it's very unfair just in terms of connectivity and how many um, like data use policies, how inaccessible it is for people. So I would think just like maybe potentially making Wi-Fi available for everybody or just when we talk about technology, I think very rich countries should be helping um, other countries with their ability to access important resources, such as just computers, tablets, Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so I think if I was the president of the world, I would help with like kind of redistributing those resources because I think it would um, help benefit us all. Thank you so much for your answer. Pelagia, what one law would you enforce? Um, my law is actually the same as Danielle's law. I definitely agree, like, uh, in terms of accessibility, uh, I would want everyone to have the same resources so that we are at the same level playing ground, So, which is especially internet connectivity, uh, because I feel like uh, it's the mo one of the important things in these times, like having access to the internet, you can do anything, you can build anything. So I would really want everyone to be able to connect to the internet, regardless of their economic or social status. Thank you so much. So your slogans are internet access to all. If you guys run for president, I'm definitely voting for either one of you. Um, the next question, again, to you both. What do you guys see as the future of young scientists? You know, especially for you guys as young black female scientists, what does the future look like for you? And others like you, I'll start with Danielle. Yeah, I think the future and you kind of already see it now, but I think that push to like, start playing around with coding and robotics at a younger age, um, I think is really big and beneficial just in terms of kind of closing the racial innovation gap. Um, so I think what I hope to see is also like um, reducing the, like how gendered things are. I think for a very long time, you think of like coders as like white men versus thinking of black women or different scientists and engineers and like who's working at the manufacturing plant. Um, so I'm hoping just in general, um, gender stereotypes aren't as much of an effect in children when they're growing up and thinking about what jobs they can hold. Pelagia, what is your answer to that? Um, yeah, as a black woman in TIG, um, I've, I feel like at some points uh, I'm usually one of the first black women to do something and um, 
I've also uh, faced some discrimination. But um, despite that, I actually see a lot of positive things because um, even though we don't have black people to look up to, we can actually be the first ones. Um, and that's a really good opportunity for us um, to be the uh, like maybe the first uh, um, in artificial intelligence algorithm that helps with X, Y, Z. Um, so I feel like we have a lot of impact that we can make and we can inspire the people who come after us. So I definitely feel like there's a lot of potential um, intake for black women um and we just have to uh even though it starts out being hard we can go on and keep um persisting and it will eventually pay off uh so as an example this year um so um i applied for this award it recognizes women intake um who are making meaningful contributions to their community and when i was applying i was like i don't see any black woman who have won the award I don't see anyone from my kind of school. I only see people from big name schools. So I don't think I should apply for this. But because I had another black woman supporting me and telling me to keep pushing my mom, I decided to apply for the award. And I actually became the first black woman to win the award in the world. Um, so I feel like um, we can actually be the first um, because we have so many problems to solve. I think we should use those problems as our pushing factors even though we don't have people who look like us to look up to and then in the future people like us who look up to us thank you so much you guys such inspirational answers um so we are inspired by you i'm sure a lot of the young scientists that are watching um see you as great models you know um but i would like to ask you guys who inspires you or what inspires you in the field of science I'll start with Danielle. Yeah, um, I think just growing up, I've just historically been very inspired, inspired by black women political figures, where there was Shirley Chisholm, who's actually the first black woman to run for president in the United States, or Angela Davis, who's been such an amazing activist. So I think um, probably something that's affected me actually becoming student body president was really just looking at um, black women who were willing to claim their own space. Um, and then also just not be afraid of speaking up for what you believe in. I think on the more science component, I do think that like large companies like Apple, um, Google, and, like Facebook, who were able to kind of transform the way people thought about something is inspiring just in terms of the idea of the product. Um, so that's more on the STEM side. Pelagia, who inspires you? Um, so for me, uh, I've uh, had a struggle with like looking for mentors in my field who have been in the same position as me, like have been uh, from Africa um, and uh, Blake and uh, female. Um, so uh, oftentimes I end up looking up to people who don't do computer science or take like my mom because of the essential roles that she does in my life. Um, and I also am inspired by the problems that are in this world. Like they inspire me to get up every day and try and do something about it. Um, yeah. So even though I don't have um, like Africans, we have done um, things that I hope to do intake. I'm still, uh, I still have problems that want to be solved and those inspire me. And also people like Nole Chikunti um, who are like pushing for girls um, and even boys to uh, succeed in STEM, seeing those people who identify with me, where I came from, my socioeconomic status, that really uh, motivates me to continue working in science. Thank you so much, guys. So now we are opening the floor to questions from our audience. I see there are so many questions here. First question from memory. What are the, some of the problems that you guys have faced being women specifically in science? I think you might have answered some of these questions, but if you'd like to just give a few pointers for, for this question, that would be great. I think we can start with Danielle. Yeah, I think it's kind of already been foreshadowed, but I think just like on a foundational basis when you're the only woman in the room, it can have a really negative effect on your own like mental well-being and health. And I think often we're thinking about 
who's chosen for a promotion, who's chosen to be do your homework list. Just if you're the only woman in the room, you're likely to be the last person chosen. So that can have a mental effect on your ability to succeed. Pelagia? Okay, uh, great question, Memory. Uh, so for me, uh, as a woman in tech, uh, I also uh, resonate with Danielle, uh, like being the only one, you, you feel like you have to represent all women. Um, and uh, that's a very hard position to be in because all women are unique. And it's also hard to get that, it's harder to get the things you deserve because there's this um, bind of being a woman. So um, how I've, managed to overcome that was uh, by talking about these challenges to other women and seeing how they have uh, tried to navigate them and also confronting uh, people because sometimes these biases um, are not are not conscious like people just do it because it has always been that way so uh, to telling them that um, you feel like you're being suppressed or or the problem that you're facing so basically speaking up for yourself um, has really helped me Thank you so much, Pelagia. It indeed is very important to speak out if you see any injustice that is directed at you. Another question we have. Oh, so Tonyara Squad does not want to sound like a job interviewer, but she wants to know from you guys, where do you see yourselves in the next 10 years? I'll start with Danielle. Yeah, so I, I, like I mentioned, I plan to go to law school after um, college. I might work a few years in between, so that could still be in law school. Um, but if not, I do hope to um, hopefully join a law firm and start practicing law. But I do want to figure out how to integrate kind of giving back to my community within my profession as well. Thank you. Pelagia, would you like to add? Yeah, um, for me, um, I, I see myself, um, as I mentioned before, working um, in take um, in order to finance my projects in Zimbabwe. Um, so I see myself working with other girls in Zimbabwe, inspiring them in the same way that I was inspired by people like Mr. Chikundi um, and uh, building technologies to solve problems that we have in Zimbabwe. Thank you so much. Do we have another question? This one is directed to Danielle. Do you see a future for us African girls and students? And can your program be extended to other countries and areas other than MIT, like our developing countries? Hmm. What would you like to say about that? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think, um, interestingly enough, I actually, there are a lot of um, MIT undergraduate population is, um, undergraduate is 10% international, um, and our grad students are actually 20% international. And I've actually met a lot of um, both um, Nigerians and Ghanaians um, who actually are in my classes. Um, so I think definitely MIT is also trying to make sure that in terms of, um, recruitment we're also looking for um people outside of america specifically um increasing diversity um with african countries so i definitely do um see that in the future increasing thank you so much next question what message do you guys have to young people who want to innovate i'll start with pelagia on that one okay um for me, um, I think something that I would tell myself um, when I was in high school trying to innovate um, in one of the outskirts of Zimbabwe is to go for it. If I cannot innovate a plane, let me try a bicycle at least, right? So, so that I do um, something to at least uh, get started because the main thing is just getting started. So um, I need a new one stage where you have a desire to the stage where you are actually pursuing that uh, innovation. So just get started. And once you get started, you find the direction to go and find the people to guide you. Even though you have, you have uh, a scarcity of resources, um, you can always um, use substitutes. Um, and actually, success is not measured by how much you had, but from, from the depths you had to climb, from the scarcity that you had, what did you make out of it? So I definitely say go for it. 
Thank you so much. Danielle. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, specifically as black women and minorities in general, you'll always find someone who's willing to like temper your expectations or tell you no. And I think one of the most important things to have is like that mentality of perseverance and always continuing on. Do we have another question? Pelagia, how do you tackle program coding problems? Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out a way to approach this problem, this question. Um, so I feel like what helps me is to try and learn the algorithms that have been uh, created before. I mean, the methods to solve the problems that have been uh, created before by people from earlier on, because the main thing is application. So once you know the what has been done before, you can now apply it to solve the current problems. And I start by like uh, brainstorming a solution. And then um, after I have um, a well figured out solution, I end up coding it up. Yeah. Right, we have a next question going on there. When you guys were young, when did you start learning and when did you get inspired and at what age? So I'm assuming this is uh, in science. When did you get inspired to pursue science? I'll start with Danielle. Yeah, so I started going to um, school when I was two years old and I think I was always interested in science so there was never really a um an age where my science interest really peaked um yeah I, th I think just in general i've always been really passionate about science and exploring things and like well we have a lot of like um like tinkering classes for kindergartners in america it's like just teaching them how to explore things and pull things apart and put them together um and i was always interested in those types of things perlagia um, when did you get inspired yeah, uh, for me, um, I, I don't remember the exact age, but I, I, I was never really the girl who liked school. Uh, I, I, um, I, I started liking school and I started working on side projects in science uh, because I felt like I was making a contribution to my community that actually mattered. Um, so when I was in my second year of high school, there was an intro competition on ozone depletion and global warming from the Ministry of Education. And I just went to the library um, and uh, researched about it. I would work for two hours to just get internet access to research more about it. And I crafted my essay and submitted it. Um, and it came second in the whole country. So I, I was like, wow, I really like this thing of trying to solve actual problems. Um, so that really inspired me. So I feel like for the older people who are here listening, um, I, I think we should encourage young people want to get started by recognizing their talents because once somebody recognizes you, it's easier to get going. For me, um, once um, somebody recognized, recognized my efforts, I just continued going on and that's when I started working on science projects, but it started with something small like writing an essay. So just uploading those small things um, really inspired me to get started with science. So I would say maybe I was 14, Thank you so much. Next question to both of you. What are the passions or interests do you guys have apart from science and patent law? Danielle. Yeah, I think one passion we both have already spoken about is um, our passion about giving back to others, specifically um, people who look like us. So I think in general, like I mentioned before, um, I'm very passionate about just making sure whatever role I hold, I'm giving back to my community. I think in, at the end of the day, the thing that matters the most is your impact. Um, so yeah, that's my main passion, honestly. Pelagia. Yeah, I'm um, also with Daniel on this one. Um, I feel like uh, my community uh, really made us to me. So I always try and go back uh, to my home country in Zimbabwe uh, over the breaks and uh, try and teach the knowledge that I have gained um, to people in my community. And I'm also um, a very strong advocate for the empowerment of black women in, in tech. So I'm actually uh, minoring in Afghanistan studies um, 
in college, that's one of the things that I study. But when I'm not studying, I like reading books and novels and dancing and running just for keeping healthy. Next question to both of you. So what is your main motivation in pursuing your careers? Danielle. Yeah, I think I also spoke to this one already, but just in general, I'm caring a lot about intellectual property and wanting to close the racial innovation gap is something that I'm passionate about. So just in terms of figuring out what I want to do after college, um, that's what I would say is the main motivation. Pelagia? Uh, what what motivates me is also like the problems that I see uh, going on in my home country that could be solved uh, with uh, no more knowledge and pursuing my career. So uh, the problem definitely motivates me. But most of all, like the people who are being affected by the problems are the people that I resonate with and care about. So that motivates me to keep going. So a question from David, he says, y'all had made something and you have dreams to help others to achieve something. What are you really doing to help them achieve their goal? Hmm, that's a deep question. So is it how are you helping others achieve their goals? Danielle, would you want to take that one first? Yeah, sure. I think one thing that's really important just in general is how important it is um, if you think you've had some type of success to try to help others. Um, so I think personally, the way I've done that is specifically with MIT admissions is trying to help other Black women get into MIT and then also pursue some. So in terms of helping them achieve goals, I think it's going past mentorship to sponsorship to make sure that you're not only giving them advice, but also pointing them in the right direction in terms of places they should apply to, things they should sign up for. So I think just really hands-on and supportive mentorship is needed. Thank you so much. Pelagia? Yeah, I definitely agree with Danielle. Um, for me, uh, in the US, I mentor about 15 women, um, and I teach them like the things that I've learned in take uh, and how to just um, uh, be uh, brave enough to stand for themselves as women and exp and navigate new opportunities. And then um, in Zimbabwe, I go back home uh, over the breaks, as I mentioned before. And last time I was teaching a programming class, so I, I try to give uh, my students uh, the knowledge that I have learned because I feel like um, it gives them a perspective to solve problems in our country, even though not directly, but it's still a way of solving problems uh, like coding. Um, and I also am uh, like, I wanted to come back to Zimbabwe over the summer break, but then because of COVID, I had to stay here. So in lieu of that, I ended up uh, developing a web application, which I will be launching uh, in about a month. Um, that's going to like have uh, links um, to opportunities that uh, young people, even in Africa can, uh, or anywhere over the world, can access in order to learn uh, the skills that I'm learning here. So I'm, I'm a big advocate for people having access to the same opportunities that I do, but they don't, so um, regardless of their economic or social status or where they are, so trying to make other opportunities that I have more accessible through this web uh, application that I'm currently developing. Thank you so much, Pelagia, for your commitment to helping others as well as Danielle. I think because of our time, we'll only take one more question, which is directed at Pelagia. It says, so how best do you overcome negativity if your parents do not support your passions? Um, yeah, that's a very um, big challenge because as I mentioned, being encouraged um, is something that really helped me get started. Um, but um, sometimes uh, the, you cannot change the way people react to your ambitions. Uh, if they are negative about it, you really need people who are positive about it. So trying to find a community outside of your family, like even friends who will be able to support you or a mentor who will tell you even when you're 
um, when you have hit rock bottom that you're doing well. So just trying to find at least one person. And also um, sometimes uh, we can get to a point where you just want to solve the problem so much such that you become uh, blind to all the criticism. Because when I was in high school working on my projects, uh, so at some points, like teachers used to tell me that I'm not focusing on school, I'm going to fail. Um, and uh, it was uh, a lot of uh, negative energy. But uh, because I just wanted to solve the problem so much, I just had to keep going. So just get started despite that negativity and you'll find it within yourself to keep going because you just really want to solve the problem you're working on. Right. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, guys, we do not have time for other questions. But what I would like to say um, for the end is, what would you guys like to say as your closing statements? Um, maybe advice to the people who are watching you and anything else you'd like to say um, to close off this interview. May I start with Danielle? Yeah, just in general, thank you so much for having me. Um, I was really excited to speak with you all today. Um, I think I would just like shout on my previous statements about like perseverance being key and not letting other people um, temper your own excitement for your future. Thank you so much. Pelagia, what would you like to say? Um, I would, I'd like to say that uh, despite the circumstances being hard or the odds being against you, you always be measured from the depths from which you you climbed. So for me, I came from a place where I didn't have electricity, no running water, but because I had the um, courage to even think about changing that situation, um, I have been able to succeed. So um, for you, even if you are like, oh, I have all these problems, just try and get started. And then that is what matters because you have had to climb higher because you are um, from more at the bottom. So just climb despite your success, your, your um, problems and you definitely make it and believe in yourself, you're doing great. Thank you so much to the both of you. This is the end of our interview session. You guys are two very inspiring women who are definitely pushing the boundaries in STEM. All the best in your careers. Um, I hope this interview has motivated uh, some of you guys out there who have been listening and has inspired you to be the change you want to see in your communities. It can definitely start with you. And yes, in your own uh, little capacities, you can definitely do something good in your communities through science. So before we close, one of the supporting organizations of this festival is Ruma KIR Indonesia. And today happens to be the birthday of its director, uh, Mr. Bayu Sachiawan. Um, so we would like to wish him a happy birthday and we have organized a little video just to say happy birthday to him. So Mr. Bayou's organization has sponsored six of the awards that will be handed out on Sunday during the award closing ceremony. Again, I say happy birthday to you. So unfortunately, we have come to the end of our opening ceremony, but of course, this is not the end of the festival. We still have tomorrow and tomorrow's sessions are on virtual science and technology. We have very exciting programs that you guys do not want to miss from neuroscience to chemistry, artificial intelligence, astronomy, biology. There's a little something for everyone here. 
But for today, I say thank you so much for all of you who've tuned in to the finalists. I wish you all the best for the award ceremony on Sunday. And to everyone else, see you tomorrow. Goodbye. <laughs>